Oh. Okay, we're going. Oh. But now you can keep talking. I'm, I'm, oh. I can, I can edit <laughs> okay. this part out. I'm just letting you know it's we going. Have, yeah, don't start picking I your nose or anything. That lives under here. Groundhogs. Oh yeah. So I don't know. The groundhogs, man, they're mean. They're mean. They click their teeth. That's a warning. Stay away. Like, don't. I never. I try to get it out, and I was clicking its teeth at me. I'm like, what the hell's that? Oh, mean? don't tell oh. me that. See, it's now like, I I'm like. Now you've made me scared. Yeah. Well, it was, it was checking my little dog, like, and she wouldn't let it go, so I was just like, it started clicking at me, and I'm like, that thing is going to attack me. Oh, God. Well, that's why I don't have, I would love to have a garden. Yeah, let them be, I was just like, if you, let them have a little space back there, then that's what you get. I don't care. Right? <laughs> no, I'm scared. Yeah. Okay. I'm scared. I Welcome them. all. Uh, this is uh, day four of the, uh, the Trouble with Normal is Everything Gets Worse tour. Um, and I am in Chester, Pennsylvania, and I'm, I'm joined by two two folks. Uh, first, uh, Christina DiGiulio, PK, uh, and also Kelsey Warren. Kelsey Kearney. is going to uh, Kearney. Gosh, I, I, I talked about did that it. Did it in the on the way I'm out. Like, I said, "There's a Kelsey in Pittsburgh." This is Kearney Warren. <laughs> I know you know who I am. That's the first time you've ever done that. So. Well, but it's With because me. I jinxed myself on the way out here. <laughs> totally I said, I hope I don't do that. And of course I did. Totally but yeah, right. Kearney Warren, who uh, is living here in Chester. I met Kearney a little bit over a year ago. Um, I was with a group of folks who came through, uh, walked for our grandchildren. Um, and what I remember about uh, Chester is that uh, we, we had a uh, upfront and personal uh, encounter with the Covanta incinerator. And one of the folks who uh, made it really personal for me um, was, was Kearney. Uh, so her story was very inspiring. At that point, she was running for city council, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, had not, I hadn't made the announcement. I don't think I was on the ballot yet. I was just collecting signatures at that time. Well, and you actually, I mean, just to continue that story, you actually did run, you did fairly well. I did uh, for a first time candidate in a very uh, party specific place like Chester against a 12 year incumbent. I got almost 20% of the votes and I started late. I started in July. Yeah. And, and just to be perfectly upfront, she was running as a green, and that really is a handicap when you're working in a in a situation like Chester and a lot of other places. Mm. If you're running as a third party candidate, but I will tell you that it was not a handicap. The handicap for me was not having enough time to campaign mm. uh, because knocking on doors, no one really cared about uh, the party once they heard my story and they knew who I was and the history and my lineage and legacy that I have here, they just, the, the, the residents wanted a change. And that, and that to me, that was Inspiring. what touched me. Um, that, yeah, you, you had that story. Okay, so uh, that's why I'm here, because you touched me. Um, and, and one of the other reasons I'm here is that Chester has a story that needs to be told. So could you tell us about Yes, sir. Sure. If you don't mind, can I take us back to when our problems actually began you so can that take we it can back put wherever it in you context? Need to. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'll start with myself. Um, I've been a long time resident here off and on uh, my entire life. Something just keeps bringing me back to Chester. I try to move away and I come back and I move away I come back. And I realized that I was actually on assignment that I had work to do here. And that work stems from my family and the, the roots that I have here. Uh, my mother's side of the family um, were uh, very spiritual people. Um, I grew up in a mission-based home. Um, my mother was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, my two aunts, her two sisters, were educators in the Chester Upland School District. Uh, and my grandmother was, she was a caregiver for the community where she lived. And so I, I learned from them that giving back is very important. Um, and then my dad's side of the family, they, my two grandparents worked at Scott Paper, um, which was not the norm um, when my father was young for, for black residents. And then they owned a convenience store. Uh, so I grew up with a sense of um, 
pride for the community and, and a sense of mission. And then also with my dad's side of the family, with them being entrepreneurs and still working. Um, and then I saw home ownership and uh, um, um, investment property ownership. They owned a, a house that was attached to their store that was attached to an apartment. So I grew up seeing what could be um, for people who looked like me through my family. Now, to go back to where the problem started in Chester, um, this was a booming, thriving city. Uh, people would come down from Philadelphia to go shopping, mm -hmm. um, to attend events. There were theaters here. Um, my parents, there were uh, roller skate rinks here. There was a lot of activities here. Um, so when the Great Migration happened, the Southern Migration of Black folks escaping the South to escape the harsh racism and um, lack of opportunities there, they migrated north. And my family was one of the, those families that migrated from Sparta, Georgia, and arrived here in Chester. Sparta, Sparta Georgia, the deep country, <laughs> deep, deep south. Um, I never understood when I was younger why my grandmother would always say, I want to go home, it's time to visit home, because I didn't understand I didn't fully understand the concept of her leaving her home right. to come up here. I grew up, this was, I thought this was our home because she had been here for so long, but she left everything that she knew to try to come seek better. So, you know, you had a, a influx of, of black residents. Um, and then by the time World War II happened and people were leaving uh, for the wars, that opened up job opportunities for people who were not, who didn't have the opportunity prior. Um, many of the black residents here, not all of us, but many of us grew, grew up in one of the public um, housing or projects as they're called, because that's where they put us. You know, we didn't have, we weren't owning a lot of homes um, back then. So when my grandparents came and the rest of her family came, um, both sides of my grandparents, Came from the south and they ended up at a different housing project um, my grandmother landed in the Bennett Ruth L Bennett homes where she raised three girls as a single mom but all three of them uh, went to college and had their own careers and so that was something that I really looked up at my looked up at to my grandmother because she was able to to do that in such hard um, rough times um, and then my father's parents, they also um, started out in one of the projects, the fairgrounds. Um, but then again, when opportunities opened for, for jobs, when the soldiers went off to war, they were able to buy their home. And once that happened, more black people were able to move into neighborhoods that were previously um, and had more white families there. Um, and then after the schools uh, desegregated, this area, Chester, was known as the Birmingham of the North because that really caused a lot of problems and riots. So when the influx of black residents moving into white neighborhoods and then desegregation mm -hmm. of the schools, white flight occurs, white exodus, white families left Chester, and the jobs left Chester as well. You know, Ford Motor Company was here. Um, there, there were so many industries here for people to um, work. Like I said, Scott Paper, which is now Kimberly Clark, yep. um, was a great employer for Chester residents. Mm -hmm. um, and once that happened, those neighborhoods that were once uh, primarily white families that were now becoming um, integrated and once the white families left those areas were deemed um, hazardous and violent and so the disinvestment occurred mm -hmm. and redlining occurred so um, once people left there was the building of the Commodore Berry Bridge and then 95 and then more in more recent years 291 which you know when highways are 
are built and bridges are built, it knocks out developments separates. and jobs, it separates people. Mm -hmm. um, and so once that happened, hazardous industries felt that, well, this is a ripe area. Uh, these people are not going to fight. They don't have, well, not, not that they won't fight. They don't have the resources to fight us like other communities have. Um, and so they came in and um, there was a, uh, an elected official by the name of John J. McClure, who was, you know, Chester was run by mob pol politics. And some may say that it is it continues today, but the Republican machine actually ran Chester. And so this one person really had his, really he was the, what he said went. If he didn't want something to happen, it didn't happen. If he wanted something Sounded to happen, <laughs> it, it happened. And so when families were trying to leave Chester as well, black families, they didn't have access to the greater wealth of the county. You know, Chester is the uh, first city and it is the only city in Delaware County. It is where William Penn mm, landed in 1682. So that's, I'll get into the extractive economies here that has also brought us to where we are now. But, um, so the disinvestment, the, the um, corruption, the, um, redlining, the harmful redlining practices, the dismantling of our school district, the lack of services, the lack of opportunities, um, these are all uh, symptoms of a systemic process to keep um, Chester residents oppressed. Um, and my job, I feel, is to empower my neighbors. I was blessed to have had parents that did different things for work. They traveled. My mother, when I was young, would bring me along with her when she would go on work trips. She would bring my grandmother and I. And now when I was younger, I didn't understand what that was doing to me, what outlook that would, I would have as I became older. Or my father, he lived in different places because of his work. And so that exposed me to different cities, different states, different zip codes. Um, I went to private school. So I saw, you know, private school and then I went to public school afterwards. So I saw the different types of uh, education. My two aunts, like I said, were um, school teachers and so was a, another cousin of mine. So I saw the, the difference um, that the schools here in Chester, um, some of the things that they had or some of the things they didn't have. Um, and I, I do believe like my generation was probably the last generation where um, we didn't have to fight for, like we're fighting now for, for a quality education because there were Votex schools, which when they left our communities, it really harmed us. And I think they left our communities on purpose. Not everyone, yeah wants to get a four-year degree you know um some of us have raw talent and skills that we just with our hands that we just need to have cultivated and so when i graduated from high school i graduated from public school in delaware um, um there was low tech schools in delaware and some of the, some of those students went on to open businesses like here in Chester, there is a one really popular hair salon here. And I can remember as we were growing up, the owner, that's what she did when we were younger. And that's what she's doing now. She is an entrepreneur here in Chester. Mm. And when other people were going to school, she was opening her business, you know. And so I think early start. Early start. And that's one thing about Chester as well. They're, they're, are a lot of entrepreneurs here my father was my family was one i grew up in a time where there were a lot of black businesses here black stores here black ownership and a lot has really really changed and it has to do with our our leadership here you know when i ran for office in city council it was by accident 
<laughs> I I actually was being groomed um, by the Emerge Pennsylvania program, and I had my eyes set on the state rep seat. Um, but after the primary um, last year, and Stefan Roots did very well, I thought maybe the residents are ready for a change. And I and I found that in my training and talking to people, my focus was always on Chester, not the county, if I was gonna run for a state rep. It was always on what I wanted to do for Chester. Right. So I thought, well, maybe that's not what I need to do if I'm focusing on Chester. And then someone emailed me and asked what I consider running for city council, but I attended a meeting with our mayor who our mayor crashed the meeting actually it was an environmental uh Some justice meeting that title. was on zoom <laughs> and someone Jeez. raised a question about what does the mayor feel about what's happening or something like that i'm summarizing and a person responded i can't remember exactly the words but the mayor then out of a two-hour meeting he didn't say anything else and did anything until this woman responded and he crashed our meeting he jumped in and it just went downhill from there he began to call her he began to say your mama your mama is a bum this is i think there were probably a hundred people on this phone call this is our leader this is our mayor i was shocked that's that's a shame i knew that our mayor had um he would behave in that way you, know, you would hear it but i had never seen it in person right and he was staying quiet and like, he was the whole time stuck. for two That's hours weird. for two hours he called yeah. her a no neck <clears throat> thief he i mean it was just horrible personal, attack. personal attacks mm -hmm. and then you know i raised a question and he referred to me as young lady and then he just he hung up on me i have the recording he just Oh, hung up on me um, and so I was offended by that um, because that was my first interaction real interaction with the mayor mm -hmm. I knew that he and my mother bumped heads because my mother was power to the people you know and opposite of what he has shown um, ironically he wrote a spread about my mom after she passed away which i was kind of shocked a lot of people were posturing after she passed away but that happens sometimes um, um so i decided after that that something needed to change i thought it starts at the with anything your job it starts at the top right you have to change the top because the top dictates how the bottom i don't want to say the bottom but resident if you're a leader it dictates how the constituents are feel about you or what how their living conditions are so i decided to run for city council and um you know it was hard it was hard i kept hearing people say nobody knows you i mean it was a lot of negativity <laughs> thrown at me um i didn't know what i was doing right at delaware county at, at the courthouse I kept going back and forth with me, my campaign manager, to make sure that we had the proper paperwork. Yeah. There, I didn't know the difference between a political body and a political and a minor party. And under the minor party option, it was really the paperwork for a political body. So I was filling out all of that and had to realize that it was wrong. So there was a lot that I just. It was not easy. I it was, feel like they were trying to confuse you. Like it was I set did. up too confused. Yes, I because I would send. I would go. I'm black I would go I would send my campaign manager who was white he would go and we would compare oh, information heck. that we would get you know because I'm like well I don't really That's trust smart. them <laughs> let's send different people to yeah. to go and see if we're getting if we're being told the same information or different information or if yeah. we're getting the same paperwork Absolutely. so this was this was in itself just to get on a ballot was a fight you know <laughs> here I am knocking doors in Chester Hi, I want to run for city council. Will you sign your name? <laughs> How many did you have to get? I only had to get about a hundred, 150, but I got about 300. Awesome. Just, you know, we went to... <laughs> they're getting shy to take half the way. Right. So, um, 
so that that was a it was a learning um it was a learning lesson but um i believe i did what i was supposed to do you know it was i'm a spiritual person so i received assignment that i needed to run for office i wasn't told that i was going to win i was told you need to run for office and i think in running for office that is where i was successful at because i changed i shook up the establishment here I believe I woke a lot of residents up to show them what leadership is supposed to look like. Mm. That we have been normalizing um, oppressive and bad behavior and you don't know when you're in it that there's something different. You don't know when you're in it that it shouldn't, it's not always the way it's supposed to be because we've been in it for so long. So you know? It's, it's abuse. It really is abuse. It's abuse because one, when residents, when we fight back, even when we just raise a question, we are met by um, hostility, primarily from our mayor. I mean, he has been known to get in people's faces. Right now, I can't probably can't talk about it. I don't know if I should even mention it. But my supervisor and another young lady from Chester are in a court case with him because he attended a environmental justice march that we were a part of and my supervisor was um, recording and he got so angry and slapped the cell phone out of his hand and it hit a young woman in her mouth. That's physical violence? This is our mayor. This wow. He told another so person controlled. that I know that he would knock her teeth out in front of her husband this is this is this yeah, is violence and so why do you think our city looks like this who you know you would think that our local government would be on our side to fight environmental racism to fight environmental justice to fight the incinerator to want us to look this place to be healthy but we have to we have to go beyond them because they're for it we have to fight we have to go out to our county can I have to go back just a little bit? Yeah. Because I think a lot of people are going to watch this and they're going to think of incinerator. What's the big deal? Yeah. Okay. Talk about what the incinerator is. So, yes. Yeah, so, the trash, we have two incinerators here. We have a trash burning incinerator with municipal waste incinerator, Covanta. Um, that incinerator is the largest in the country and it operates with few um, quality controls. Um, incineration when it comes to well environmental racism when it comes to incineration uh is not um based on class so most incinerators the largest incinerators the 16 out of the 20 largest incinerators are located in um communities of color that's why they're that's why it doesn't have anything to do with class so you figure this city has about 33, 34,000 people. It's roughly maybe three miles long, give or take a mile. Um, and this incinerator sits on a block where there, a residential block. I have family that live on that block. So not only is Covanta incinerator there, but we also have Del Cora sludge waste incinerator at this on the same block so what happened Talk about sludge waste. okay so understand sludge that. waste is pretty much um your feces <laughs> your 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 bathroom you know when you use the bathroom that's what uh goes to this the sludge waste so when they empty out incinerator. for example or septic tanks into this truck it's, to take that's what so they're really shitting on chester <laughs> it's not even funny <laughs> right but it's like yeah so and that Literally. goes back to what i was Don't saying about stuff. industries coming in and thinking that this is this place is ripe for harmful practices because who, who would care about these poor black people here you know um roughly only what half of residents over 16 are are employed here our, our our poverty rate is about 30 30.4 percent so, so that's also an issue we have these industries coming in 
but the local community doesn't benefit from that either. Huh. I'm, I'm glad that you raised that, um, that you made that comment because that goes back to extractive economies here in Chester. You're absolutely right. Not only do many of these um, companies not benefit the residents here, but the residents are not often made aware of what is coming until ground is breaking. Yep. We are left in the dark. We don't get mailers um, about what's happening. And so residents will live on the block, not know what's going on until they see it groundbreaking in front of them. Um, extractive economies. Let's go back to the William Penn. William Penn landed in Chester in 1682. We have a poor, pathetic marker. Where is Penn's Landing, the great visitor's station? Philadelphia, yeah. Penn's Landing, Philadelphia. We have a <laughs> casino here. What is that called? Philadelphia Harris, but it's in Chester. We have a soccer stadium here, which is in Chester. What is that called? Philadelphia Union. We have a correctional institution that has Chester's name in it. Yeah. <laughs> wow, <laughs> pride, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, you have to wonder the intention behind all of this. This this extractive economy. We have a marijuana plant in Ch uh, plant in Chester. We have a dispensary in Chester, and now they're building. Speaking of not residents not knowing what's happening, they are actually building a large another marijuana processing plant in a residential area. And the residents had no idea what was happening until they started seeing people build and they asked what's going on here. Oh, and I, mm, and there's no decriminalization of it yet in this community. <laughs> wow. Stop for a second. Check your mic and see if it's still got a green light on. It's up there in the corner. To get your green. Is it green? Yes, it's green. Mine died. So. Oh, okay. So. So it's still your show. Okay. So. <laughs> Speaking about, you know, um, getting ready for the future, you know, there is a lot of money and right, like you said, the, we're getting ready for marijuana to become recreational, right? So people are positioning themselves to, to get ready for that, right? And then, then what else happens, what else comes with that? You have these rehab cases. So two doors down from me, no one told me, no one sent flyers out to my community to say, hey, we're having a, we're, we're opening a home on your block. Wow. A residential home. There's a, resi there's a residential home right here. And there was no, you guys have no free time from sustainability from the state. And I'm not saying just that. Just being fully informed. Of just being you informed. Yeah, because yeah. I know sometimes what that has caused in other areas in Pennsylvania. People have had problems with noise and loud, you know, people hanging out. Good. Right now, it hasn't been a problem, but you want to know why you see strange people walking up and down your your neighborhood at night when you when you know most of the people on your block, and then you start to see strange men walking up and down. Transient. It's like you know there is no roots here where you're, and this is roots. You guys probably know everybody, right? And it's it is odd. What's the intention? Like, what kind of these people? You don't. You know your neighborhood and community. Right. That is a lot, and that's absolutely. I thought there was. I didn't even know they could do that. I did. Well, like, apparently you. Ooh. Apparently you can, and we have more than one. That's the. They. It's. It's almost. You know what the narrative of of the Chester residents is here that we don't want anything that's positive and good, but we want all the bad things. And because of that, I had to meet with one of my elected officials just to say, hey, listen. There's a lot that's going on here in Chester, and I see you in photos. I just want to make sure that you understand that the residents, this is not what we want all the time. And so you have to begin to get to know more than the same people who are part of the friends and family plan with our local government. There's, there's a friends and family plan. I'm not a, I'm not a part of that. You know, I'm not, not in a circle. I'm not in a circle. And mm -hmm. then, so also what happens in Chester, which the general public probably does not know because we get such a bad rap, that there are haves and have-nots in Chester. We're just small. 
Chester's just small, but we're like any other community with the same issues that happen everywhere else. We're just small and compacted, so a lot of things, the bad things are uh, heightened. But we have the haves and have nots here in Chester. Yeah. Let, me, let me just, we're right getting close to half an hour. Okay. But I want you to talk now, and, and they're not going to be able to hear me at all. Okay. But talk now about what needs to happen in Chester. What needs to happen? Chester needs new leadership. Chester needs leadership that is for the people. I understand that, you know, you have to invest and, and put money out for, for, for different things, but you have to make sure that whatever is coming here is also going to benefit the, the, the residents. My, my take is we bring businesses here, but it's not bringing people out of poverty. There's not a grocery store here. I'm lucky I have a car. I can get in my car and go. But do you think that I always want to get in my car to go to a play or get in my car to go for grocery shopping or get in my car to go for any quality resource? Uh, I, along with other residents, are putting money into other municipalities. Wow. Let me tell you real briefly why Chester is a gold mine. And this is what I ran on. Chester is a gold mine because number one, we have a waterfront. And any place that you know that has a waterfront is worth what, billions of dollars. And what does it look like when you travel around? Tell me, what do waterfronts look like when you travel? There's all kinds of businesses Beautiful on the waterfront. Things, sure, yeah. Class, like it's all things, large things. Yeah, right? There's things to do on the water. There's things to do on the water. Yeah, it is. So let's just you say make one. a walk out of it too. You <laughs> we have a waterfront. Two, we have exits off the major interstate 95. We have more than one exit yep. off and on to the interstate. That's cute. Do you know how many people pass Chester every day? Not only pass Chester, do you know when there is traffic, the traffic is diverted into Chester City? The people have to drive through Chester? Really? But what do we have to offer these people that are driving through? We are missing out on so much. That's so true. We're missing out on so much. Not only so, so we have the waterfront. Yeah. We have the exits off 95. We also have transportation hub. We have. We are on the major R2 line from Wilmington or Newark all the way up to Norristown on the SEPTA R2. Amtrak goes pass on the same track. We don't have a stop here at Amtrak. It. But I think long ago when it was called Pennsylvania Railroad, I believe there was a stop in right. Chester. I, I, I think it. so. Yeah. So we, we're on a local commuter line. We're on a commuter line. Um, so what we have as a competitive advantage, as most intentionally disinvested communities have, is location. And so what we need to do to answer your question again is to stop, um, is to get out of the habit of social investments. We have enough social programs. They're needed. I'm not saying that they're not needed. But in, until we get out of the habit of putting efforts into social investments, we're not going to be able to capitalize off of our competitive advantage and, 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 and have a um, competitive shared value system of um, financial investments in Chester. We just, they just opened this huge access center. Now, you know, I don't know what it's all about, but if you ask me, maybe it has something to do with the closing, the threatening of closing some of our hospitals in this area. Mm -hmm. Because what I've read is that this access center is going to offer rehab services and all showers and all kinds of different services for huh. this for the city it's huge i believe don't call me i have yeah. to check maybe i should even say how the stats this, yeah <laughs> but i believe there was it was over a million dollar investment okay. in it but it's a non-profit oh, okay so it's not benefiting it's not going to bring chester people out of right. poverty it's 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 going to uh attack the symptoms yep. of poverty. Absolutely. Again, once again, once so these are the things that come into the city. Um, 
and our leadership, they're for that. They're for selling our water authority. Mm. This is the only, one of the few great assets that Chester has. Our water authority has been in business for over 170 years plus, I think 170, 175 years. It has never been in distress, not once. We don't just service Chester. We don't just service Delaware County. We service, I think Chester Water Authority also services Chester County. So mm -hmm. Aqua Water wants to buy, Aqua America, sorry, wants to buy um, Chester Water Authority and, and our uh, Delcor, our, our um, sewage company. They want to own the pipes underground in, yep, in Pennsylvania. That makes sense, Aqua. Mm -hmm. So I know what happened years ago when they purchased, um, they, what happened? They closed down Springton, Springton Lake. It was a reservoir. Yeah. But now they, they built a um, wealthy retirement <laughs> complex and they have lake view, they have a view. But I remember as a child going to, to the spring to get water with my grandfather and now the public no longer has access wow. to it. And people who, who have switched over, our, our rates are going to nearly triple. Yep. Yeah, not serving people it, anymore, serving profits. How are we going to trust a public, a, a private company to be seen and get with how out of control capitalism is? And then you're going to give your most precious resource to the that. The most what? precious, re and, and they're saying, you know, well, because the city is on a verge of bankruptcy, but even if they were to sell it to Aqua, that's not going to take us out of our financial woes, which is because of mismanagement. Mm -hmm. We have a receiver now. The receiver has had to take our elected officials to court. The receiver was placed here to wow. give suggestions on how to bring us out of uh, distress, financial distress. Our elected officials have been fighting him along the way. Our, they raised their salary in a place that is on the verge of bankruptcy. <laughs> oh. He, of course they did. he hasn't been able to get receipts from um, an elected official who is also, I believe the title is financial director. Oh, geez. That would be a pretty much basic skill for that person, wouldn't it? it, it <laughs> financial director? Kind of part of the job <laughs> description. So, oh, wow. you want to know how did Chester get to where we are? Well, there you go. Public mismanagement question. if you read Bloomberg there's an article in Bloomberg that really spells out a little bit of what's happening with the financial distress here um, and and my take on this is if we do go into bankruptcy there's two things one is not always a bad situation what makes it bad is that you don't know who that person is that will be in charge of it's his type that title is not Caught receiver like it is on the state level and there's another name for it I believe well the thing right now is our receiver has been working with the residents of Chester he's been very transparent he has an open door policy he has been here to help if we go into bankruptcy and the federal the, the, the and it's federal um, takeover well one we don't know what the intentions of this receiver is and what the intentions of the of the feds are there and, and there's no uh, compromise when they come in we have to do what yep. is told unlike now when there's some wiggle room the receiver wants to work trying to figure out things now there is a little fight I think he he goes back and forth but I think he is pushing for the sale of um, the water authority but I do think that he is open to looking at other alternatives um, because I, I, I do understand that when poor communities are in distress, the first thing that they want to sell off is the Their, whatever assets they whatever have. Whatever assets sure. that they have. So we, we are in a very peculiar place. And then wow. one last thing on top of this, we have an election coming up. Now, what has really been good for Delaware County and for Chester, but mostly Delaware County because this person will be over the, the county, not just Chester, Carol Kazim, who ran for state rep, I helped with her campaign in the primary. We pushed her to win the candidacy, the Democrat candidacy of um, state rep. This is very important because she knocked the knees off of a giant, off a dynasty. 
Our mayor was once the state rep. Oh. He became the mayor and his nephew became the state rep. I got the music. <laughs> you going for the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. You see where I'm going? <laughs> now you get it, right? I now love you the get strategy. It. So, um, <laughs> this was a huge win. Yeah. But we have to knock the knees off. I mean, knock the head off. And unfortunately, I don't know who the next mayor candidate is going to be. <laughs> I, think, I think I knew who I'm, I would vote for. <laughs> of course, I'm not here. I think we have to close because my, my camera's going to run out too. Okay. But last words. Last words is that um, we all are in a fight for our lives together. Every community. What happens in my community will eventually happen in yours and vice versa. So I think I would suggest that we all take a deeper look when we hear about certain neighborhoods that we may not have ever visited or talked to people, I think it's important for us to take a deeper look to understand why um, conditions are the way that they are. When you come to Chester, there's a reason um, our conditions are the way that they are here. I work, I live in Chester, um, you know, so I want better for my community, just like many people here want better for their community. What happens is you form, you get um, apathy, right? Because you don't see any change. And so you mm. become complacent. Um, but we have to just join in and fight together to save our democracy, to elect candidates that are for the people. A lot of times we get mad at our elected officials, but what happens is we don't support the candidates that are really for us. So we're working backwards. Mm. We may say oh i don't think that that person will win well if you don't vote for them they're not going to win thank you so we have to change our mindset and really begin electing candidates the candidates who will best fight for the people absolutely perfect thank you so much I mean, everybody could that's great and it's, absolutely and if everybody okay. did it, i love that you said that it's exactly it's like a logic I, it's but they're not gonna win.